Welcome back, forensic students. We are moving right on through this unit, uh, and today we're focusing on different types of evidence. So we know that crime scene investigators try to use their observation skills to find evidence, and then they try to interpret the meaning of that evidence through different scientific analysis, um, and then they try to piece together, and eventually, hopefully, they um, get to present this information in the court of law. Now, we're going to talk about how forensic investigators classify evidence, specifically what are the names for these different types of evidence. But before we get started, I do want to make a disclaimer. Some of the terms are used interchangeably. So depending on the agency or the jurisdiction, you might have investigators that call or have terms for the things that we're going to talk about that are different but mean the same. For example, in my conversations with agencies in the state of Georgia, police department, sheriff's um, personnel, uh, I have found that what some investigators call circumstantial evidence is what other investigators call trace evidence. Um, and so this has been a really hard concept for me as a teacher to wrap my head around, but the only thing that I can come up with is that they just used different terms to mean um, the same thing, but just they're just different terms. So it is very likely if you are not one of my students and you're watching this video that your teacher might have might has have called um, one of these forms of it evidence something different than what I will present to you. It's just a difference in the name. They mean the same thing. All right, so with that being said, I think all investigators, agencies, forensics teachers everywhere recognize this term or this name, Dr. Edmund Locard. So learn him. He is an in integral part of forensics while we study forensics. He is known as the father of forensics because he did establish the first forensics laboratory that we know of in 1910. And he is famous for what we call the low cards exchange principle. So it doesn't matter what investigator you talk to uh, all over the world. Um, my guess is if you say Edmund Locard, they will finish it by saying exchange principle. Every contact leaves a trace, which is the famous saying that was coined by Dr. Locard. So um, basically Locard's exchange principle states that when a person comes in contact with an object or another person, a cross transfer of physical evidence or biological evidence can occur. So that exchange in materials indicate that two entities were in contact. And that's sort of what forensics revolves around. So this evidence bears a silent witness to the criminal act and the intensity, duration, and nature of the entities in contact determine the extent of the transfer. So again, all of that, Dr. Edmund Locard said, um, can be summed up in his coined phrase, every contact leaves a trace. So it is the role of an investigator to figure out where those contacts could have occurred and to find that trace evidence that can then be collected and analyzed. So forensics is built upon this principle, cross transfers create evidence and evidence solves crimes. So I want you to take a few seconds to just on a sheet of paper, jot down as many types of trace evidence that can be found at a crime scene. So imagine you are a forensic investigator, you're working a crime scene, just jot down in 60 seconds as many things as you can think of um, that could be possibly found as evidence in that crime scene. So pause the video now and do that. Now, after the video or the lesson, I want you to come back and I want you to try to classify those different pieces of evidence that you wrote down. All right, so evidence can be found in many forms. We've talked about this in previous lessons, but investigators have to be able to classify that evidence. So all evidence can either be direct or circumstantial. 
So the first thing you need to know is that all evidence can be classified in one of two ways. Either it's direct or circumstantial. So circumstantial evidence can be further classified as either physical evidence or biological evidence. And we're going to go through definitions and examples. So direct evidence. Let me go back real quick. Remember, all evidence can be either direct or circumstantial. So let's focus on the, the most simplistic that can't be further divided, um, which is direct evidence. So the, these include your firsthand observations. This could be, for example, an eyewitness account, a police dashboard uh, video, video surveillance from a convenience store. It could be voice recordings signed ransom notes. Um, so this this gets kind of muddy um, when we're talking about ransom notes because if you have a ransom note that's unsigned, it falls into a different category. But a signed ransom note, even if the signature is not recognizable, um, it, it counts as direct evidence. And then reports. So toxicology reports, lab reports, autopsy reports, all of those would be considered direct evidence um, in the court of law. So I do want to give you an example. I put on the screen, you can see the last page of the ransom note from the John Monet Ramsey case. It was signed, but it was signed SBTC. They never figured out, investigators never found out who that was what those initials stood for, um, but even though they they didn't know who SBTC was, since it was signed, it just did count as direct evidence. Now, circumstantial evidence is anything that's not direct, right? It's an indirect evidence that can be used to imply a fact, but not directly prove it. So I tell my students, ask yourself, is there some investigation work that has to be done to this piece of evidence? Did you see it? Did you hear it? Um, or is it written as a report? If not, it's probably circumstantial. Not all the time, but probably. So an example of circumstantial evidence would be prints. That's all kinds of prints. DNA, ballistic evidence, hairs, fibers, blood spatter. Um, so we're going to go through in unit two and talk about all the different types of evidence and we will classify so we'll break up our unit two into biological evidence and physical evidence and we will also talk about them in terms of circumstantial or direct evidence so circumstantial evidence remember can be further classified into physical or biological and this is where the definitions get a little um, murky biological evidence can include anything from a plant, an animal, or a mineral. Let me say that again. Biological evidence is derived from a plant, an animal, or a mineral. So if it comes from a plant, animal, or mineral, it's biological. Everything else is physical. Okay. So examples of physical evidence would be prints, fingerprints, lip prints, shoe prints. All prints are physical. You might be thinking, Miss Niblet, but lip prints come from a person, so it would be biological because a person is an animal. The print itself is made from dirt or debris from the skin, so that's why it is classified as a physical um, piece of evidence. Bullets, weapons, synthetic fibers, so synthetic or man-made fibers that are made in a laboratory, all of these are physical pieces of evidence. Biological evidence would include DNA, hair, natural fibers, because all of these come from either a person, a plant, an animal, mineral. Now there are other ways to classify evidence. You can classify evidence as class or individual. So class evidence narrows down a group of people or items. For example, shoe prints. So if I'm working a crime scene and I find a Nike shoe print, I measure it and I determine it came from a size eight and a half shoe. Um, and the person may have weighed that left the shoe print may have weighed approximately 150 pounds. Then what I'm doing is I'm narrowing down my list of suspects, but it cannot 
directly link or directly point to an individual person, but it can be helpful. Blood type is another example of class evidence. So if somebody has AB negative blood, that narrows down the suspect field, but doesn't necessarily point to an individual person. If hair is left at the crime scene and the hair does not include a follicle, so the follicle is the part of the hair that contains nuclear DNA, uh, um, then we have what's called class evidence. Now, if you can get mitochondrial DNA from hair, which we'll talk about when we get to hair, that's a different story. But if it's hair without the follicle and no DNA can be collected, it's just as a short, brown, curly hair, uh, then we have class evidence. Individual evidence can link directly to an individual. So this would be DNA, great example of individual evidence. Hair with the follicle. So we know you can collect DNA from a lot of hair samples that are found at crime scenes, um, and it will link to a, a person. Fingerprints can also be individual evidence. So if a fingerprint is lifted and then it's matched to a suspect, um, then we have individual evidence. All right, so those are the different types of evidence, and I will see you in the next lesson.